Hi, I'm Femi O'Kay. In June 1981, the very first scientific report about a mysterious infection that appeared to attack the immune system was published. That syndrome was AIDS and the virus that was actually causing it was eventually named HIV. Today on the stream, we are bringing together three activists from around the world to reflect on 40 years of HIV and AIDS. How far have we come regarding managing the virus? In 2011, I sero converted to HIV positive at just 23 years old. It was a scary time because I didn't have the finances or the support to seek treatment. So I started to really examine what my life was like, what legacy I would leave behind. And in truth, I'm realizing this is my legacy. It's all about making sure we speak up and we speak out. I think we need to do what we can to protect each other's lives, protect our communities, and to create broader reach for the drugs that can help save us. Being a Black woman living with HIV has been a very interesting experience, to say the least. It's one that has made me realize the extreme vulnerability of women, particularly Black, Brown, and ethnic women across the globe, and their... Um, exposure or vulnerability to HIV transmissions. And it's through this fight that I have been graced to help others, especially black women who show up in this world like me, overcome, live, thrive, in spite of this diagnosis. What is your HIV AIDS story? What questions would you like to ask our guests? You can jump into the comment section, be part of today's program. Let me introduce you to our guests. Actually, they're going to introduce themselves to you. Hello, Vince. Hello, Maura Lake. Hello, Dr. Linda Gale. Vince, tell everybody who you are, what you do in the context of this 40-year anniversary of us knowing that AIDS existed. Hi, my name is uh, Vince Chrysostomo. Um, I'm the Director of Aging Services at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And it's a program that serves and caters to long-term survivors, the AIDS generation. So those of us who survived the epidemic of the 80s and 90s. Good to and have I've been living with HIV for 34 years myself. Oh, so good to have you with us. Maura Lake, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our international audience. My name is Rolake Odeto Imbo. Well, my full name is Morolake, but I don't get that name until I'm in trouble. <laughs> I... I won't call you, I won't call you Morolake then. <laughs> <laughs> I tested positive to HIV in 1998. Um, I am the executive director for Positive Action for Treatment Access, and I also work for St. Lawrence University as a mental health counsellor. Good to have you. Dr. Linda Gale, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our international audience. Hi, Femi. That's right. I'm Linda Gale, known as LGB as well. I'm a medical doctor trained in infectious diseases doctor, closet social worker. I've been working in the HIV field now for going on 30 years. Um, I run an organization called the Desmond Tutu HIV Center here in Cape Town. And our purpose is to reduce the impact of HIV and related infections, including tuberculosis, in people from some of the poorest communities here in uh, the southern tip of Africa. So good to have so many perspectives with us on the stream today. Uh, I'm going to get you to bounce around the different parts of the world and remember your, your different experiences. Linda Gale, I want to start with you because as we were watching those HIV survivors living with HIV, you were nodding. What a very different atmosphere today than from 40 years ago when I, I'm just going to say it was terrifying. That is what I remember. What do you remember from the 1980s, early 1980s? As you say, entirely terrifying, Femi. People dying in droves all around us. Um, I remember, you know, there were just funerals upon funerals. I was a young medical doctor up in northern KwaZulu. Uh, very hard hit by the HIV epidemic here in Southern Africa. And, you know, it, it was extraordinary how the, the wards filled up with young people. I think that was the most frightening, was that we weren't dealing with the, the sick and dying amongst elderly people, people who were at the end of their lives. These were people in the prime of their lives and children, babies, um, you know, that was the hardest thing for somebody who was a young, new um, healthcare worker who wanted to save lives and make people better, suddenly to be surrounded by so much death and dying and, and seemingly no way 
of actually stopping the tsunami of death that was coming upon us. So it was a terrifying and powerless time in many ways. I just want to go to you, Vince. I've, I've got this, this picture, um, and you have to smile when you look at it, but it's, it's also a picture of somebody that you love very dearly who also succumbed to the AIDS, uh, to AIDS and, and died from HIV. What was your first understanding of what having AIDS meant? Well, um, that it was entirely fatal, um, that people would um, run away from you. That, um, the, pic the person in the picture is Jesse Solomon. Yeah. He was my partner. He died in October of 1991. And, you know, the first night Jesse and I got together, I had to tell this guy that I'm HIV positive. And so I brought him to a corner on um, New York, like 4th Avenue and 6th, and told him, Jesse, I have to tell you something. I said, Jesse, I have HIV. And he's like, is that it? He goes, Vince, that's nothing. I have AIDS. And he said, I said, you do? And he said, well, what do you think these spots are on my face? They're, they were Carposis sarcoma. And, you know, I thought, oh, I just thought you had a bad complexion. I didn't realize that's what it was. But, you know, over the course, Jesse and I were together for about two years. And he taught me so much about life to think in terms of possibility. I remember thinking that if I loved him enough, he wouldn't die. And then I remembered that, and then I realized that if I really loved him, I had to let him go. And so he died in my arms around 7 a.m. on October 6, 1991. And to this day, he is the love of my life. Um, I try to do my work in, in his spirit. So, Rilake, I'm, I'm just listening to Linda Gale's story, where she was seeing so many people dying in South Africa, and then Vince lost his partner. So many people died in North America. There were people dying around the world. And then you found out you had AIDS. Did you just think, I am going to die? So I found that I have HIV. Yeah. I was very healthy, perfectly healthy. Yeah. I was 28. Yeah. Um, the last, furthest thing on my mind was HIV. Um, but when I was told I had HIV, this was a year after Fela died. Fela Kuti, mm -hmm. who's a well-known musician. The most in famous Nigeria. musician in the entire universe. In the <laughs> says the Nigerian in the room. <laughs> yes. Uh, I Okay. loved Fela. I grew yeah. up listening to his records. I would go to, mm -hmm. I mean, from college, from Ife, I went to university, um, Abafmiola University in Ife, would go, I'd go to watch Fela. Then his brother, who was the Nigerian health minister, Professor Kuti, announced that Fela had died of an AIDS-related illness. This was in 1997. And the mood was, it was very scary. Mm -hmm. I was terrified not because of AIDS, but the fear and the stigma. So when I was told in 1998 that I had tested HIV positive, I just thought about Fela and what that meant. It was an atmosphere of silence, of shame, of fear. Um, it was, I, I remember wanting to talk to my mother about this, and I went home and I told, they had these things on TV, this um, uh, radio, TV uh, promos and I was asking yeah. my mother mom what would you do if you had that somebody what do you think of all the people with HIV and what my mother said to me was well this is what happens when you don't take care of yourself and um, it's it's not a problem I could not talk to my mother because as far as she was concerned her daughter is married her daughter is educated her daughter is doing well HIV was the last thing my mother was thinking about um, and that was the mood when I tested HIV positive in Nigeria. Add to that the fact that we had no access to treatment. So HIV infection definitely meant death. It was a sure death, but it was also a slow, shameful, painful way to die. So the fact that you, Relake, and Vince, you're sitting right here on the stream talking to us shows that there's been an evolution in terms of treatment for 
HIV. One of the things that I, I wanted to bring in here is a, a gentleman that I'm sure is globally well known, Dr. Anthony Fauci. 40 years ago, he was a researcher looking into the causes of AIDS, treatment of AIDS. And a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to him for the International AIDS Society podcast, looking at the whole history of the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. Um, and where are we now? And I asked Dr. Fauci about what can we expect in the next five years? This is what he told me. The one last thing that we absolutely need to do that would be the nail in the coffin of this pandemic would be a safe and effective vaccine. And that's a lot of efforts being put into that. And as difficult as it is, I believe it's achievable. So Vince, you're, you're sitting there having lived with having HIV for so many years. What would you like to ask Dr. Linda Gale? What, is there a moment in your career that defines your work to you? Something that happened, a person? I think, Vince, there are, there are probably a number of people. I want to say I am unbelievably privileged, I would say, despite the fact that it has been harrowing at times. It has been, you know, tragic on so many occasions. It has been a sheer honor and privilege to take care of people who have faced this diagnosis, um, stared it down, and lived through it, uh, as well as those who, unfortunately, either because treatment was not made available or they couldn't take the treatment or circumstances were just such that they were not lucky enough to survive the disease. Even those, I have learned such an amazing amount from it, just in terms of resilience, bravery, courage, um, you know, the, the persistence and the incredible willingness to give um, and continue giving. I mean, it really has been an extraordinary experience. I often say to people, you know, I get asked, how do you do this? How do you go into work every day? I say, I can't imagine doing anything differently. Um, it truly is a field of, of medicine that I think um, is like no other. And, and, and that, I think, is because we truly do understand that this is way beyond a disease. It is not just a condition. It is not just a virus. It actually touches individuals in so many aspects of their lives, their psyche, their, their families, their, their every sphere of their being. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, as, as healthcare providers, we also have to dig deep and find so many more levels to over and above just providing medication or, you know, taking care of the ill. Um, and I think that has been the most extraordinary experience of my life. It defines who I am uh, and it certainly fuels my passion for the work I do. You know, when I came back to San Francisco, um, I was in Thailand and I did international work for a while. And um, I remember not wanting to take the job that I now have because I said, I've done my part. I spent my whole adult life working in HIV AIDS. I want to do something different now. And I don't know. It's like the universe had other plans. It just kind of directed me back. And after about three weeks of doing this, I thought, whatever made me think I didn't want to do this? It's been some of the most gratifying work of my life. I feel like we get a chance to do um, what, get right what we didn't get right the first time around. And I don't know if more lucky remembers me, but we've crossed paths several times when I was on UNAIDS Seven Sisters. So, yep. And yep. when you meet people, you never know if you're going to see them again if they're positive. You know, you never know who's going to be at that place at the table. 
And it's so good to see you. I mean, it's just amazing. You're not even any grayer. I'm much grayer than the last time you saw me. <laughs> I was going to say, Vince, do you remember me? I remember I you. Remember all right, you. All right, all right, guess. <laughs> steady, steady on, steady on. Let's let's get back. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good point in that if you are positive, will we see that person again? And that, that to me, that's, that's given me goosebumps. Vince, you talk about your work. I want to talk about Relake's work. Relake, have a look here. You, you know these pictures. But education for you is so, so important. Having someone to talk to, understanding what is going on. Tell us about your work and why education is, you know, we don't have a vaccine yet, but education, often people say education is the next best thing, thing to a vaccine. Knowing about how you could get sick may well stop you from getting sick. Tell us about your work. I got, I took charge of my life when I learned what HIV was. Mm -hmm. Before then, I lived in fear. I was afraid. But then I realized this is a virus. It's mm -hmm. a virus. There's a way to address it. There's treatment. Or there can be treatment, even though we didn't have treatment in Nigeria. And having that information gave me the drive to fight. Then I went to the AIDS conference and I met activists. And what HIV did for me is it gave me back my life. Mm -hmm. um, I just got, it was a new surge. There was something to live for. There was something to die for. And that's what I started working on. When I started working on HIV, my work right now centers on young people, adolescents. When I was in treatment, um, I think it was a treatment uh trial in 1999. I was 29 years old and I go, would go into these clinics and I'd see children. Then as I qualified for treatments, I, could, I, I wasn't seeing treat young people again. I saw babies, I saw adults, I didn't see young people. And I kept wondering what happened to all those children? What happened to all those babies? After we got medication, their young people were they? And that thinking of adolescents and young people is what caused my work to pivot. And then I focused on adolescents, children born with HIV, who have known no other life, who have had to live with this infection, and are now going to college and now in boarding houses. That has been what I've focused on, women and girls. Um, and I work with, we have a home called Mary's Home. It's the only home in Nigeria that addresses the needs of young teenage girls with HIV. Um, and that's because when people lose their family members or even people who are in the system, nobody wants to adopt a teenager. Nobody wants to adopt, uh, people are looking for babies. Um, if you're a teen who's loved one of both parents, what do you do, where do you go? Uh, we do not have the kind of social welfare system you have in other developed countries. Your family is your social support network. If you don't have family members who can take you, then you end up in the streets, or you'd end up with a relative who would physically, sexually, emotionally abuse you. Um, so that's what I've done, yeah. educating young people and making sure that children with HIV know what's going on and that knowledge would help address the shame and the fear that HIV places on you. So, guess we asked our extended online community, what are the biggest challenges still regarding HIV and AIDS now that we are 40 years into understanding them so much better? This is what they told us and then I'm going to ask their guests what they feel the biggest challenges are. Have a look. We believe there has to be a huge investment in not only the scientific tools that have revolutionized our response to HIV, but in the same way, we need an investment in the drivers of HIV. We do a lot of work in order to make sure that women living with HIV are able to develop their leadership skills, have more seats at the table, be involved in research design in clinical trial design, and then being the voice to ensure that other women living with HIV are hearing from them about some of these issues. So, to bring an end to AIDS, meds alone are not enough. We must couple medications with activism, with social policies and programs, so that all people in all parts of the world have an equal chance of not becoming infected with this virus. Never been short of ideas when it comes to tackling AIDS, but sometimes it's political will, sometimes it's resources. Vince, what needs to be done now, 40 years on? 
well, it should always be people, the for-profits, mm. that there should be equal access to um, treatments across the, um, across the globe. You also, in the U.S. and in developed countries, 50%, 55%, I think, of the people living with HIV are over the age of 50. You wouldn't need to invest. You know, we talked earlier about not having a 30-year plan. There needs to be a plan. Mm. I think we need to think about those of us who survived. Um, we need to redo what it means to age and to age gracefully. Um, yeah, there needs to be an investment and we need to get right. I recently um, went to, um, attended a consultation for BIPOC, um, Black Indigenous People of Color here. And the document that was produced looked remarkably like the same document we produced like 20, 25 years ago yeah. in, this, in a similar meeting. So we need to have different outcomes. Mm. These documents seem to be just a deliverable for somebody's, you know, for somebody's job or somebody's office. But we need to have outcomes that will change the um, the trajectory of this. And also, we need to raise women and girls and transgender folks up. We need to change that all this misogyny. We need to get rid of punitive laws against people who use drugs. We need to recognize that sex work is work. It needs to be legal. I could just keep going on yeah, and on and we need, on. We need another show, Vince, for the challenges and your ideas and your solutions. Let me share, let me share the, the closing moments of this show with Rolake. Rolake, what do you feel is the most important challenge right now? Invested in women and girls. Ah access yeah. to resources, mm -hmm. continued access to resources. Right now, with the HIV funding drying up, all the money is going just into medication. Uh, but it's not just about medication, like others have said. We mm -hmm. must go back and invest in communities. Human beings make the change. We made a change. We m made sure there was access to treatment. We advocated um, for so many things. And if we, if we forget about the human beings and we just focus on the medication, then we'd lose it. I am your vaccine. For as long as I'm on treatment and my viral load is non-detectable, I can't infect my baby. I cannot transmit HIV. I'm not sexually transmissible, which means it keep investing in human beings and invest in women and girls who are the ones who build up their communities. They're the ones who never leave. They're the ones who never forget. Uh, Dr. Linda Gale, Abraham Abebe asks on YouTube, why is it so hard to find vaccines for HIV? <laughs> Femi, uh, we're up against a formidable foe. The HIV virus is, um, is complex, it's stealthy, it really um, has found ways over the years to evade our immune system. So that is the starting point. Second to that, I think the COVID response and the discovery of a COVID vaccine within not 12, but 11 months, it's been extraordinary. And I think what it shows is that given sufficient resources, given sufficient political will, given collaboration, we can do this. So I have to agree with Dr. Tony Fauci that, um, you know, I think it is within the wherewithal of the of the world. But we're going to have to increase the 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 real drive to find a vaccine. And that means collaborations, private public partnerships, academic partnerships, resources, and a drive to find that vaccine. It isn't easy, but we have to believe it can happen. Primary prevention is the way to overcome this epidemic. Mm. You mentioned Dr. Rauchy there, and I'm going to give him the last word because he drew the connection between AIDS and HIV research and the COVID vaccine right now. Let's have a listen to him. If you have the restrictions of a clinical trial, that excludes so many people who have no other option and no other intervention, no other drug, be it a drug for HIV or for an opportunistic infection. So many of the activists, for example, led in ACT UP by Jim Igo, led on the West Coast by Marty Delaney, were saying, why not do a parallel track? Why don't you allow the drug to be made available to people under informed consent who have no other options for treatment. Thank you so much. There's so much more to talk about. I could have you three on for the whole week, but I would probably get into trouble. Dr. Linda Gell, <laughs> Moralake, 
Relake, because you're not in trouble with me. And also, Vince, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. I'm going to ask you one more time to have a look at my laptop. This is the AIDS Memorial on Instagram. I highly recommend you look through it as we reflect on 40 years of HIV and AIDS, some of the amazing stories of love, loss and remembrance. Thanks for joining me today. See you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.